so far we've presented a macro matching model with a representative agent and then we've uh, presented a macro matching model with heterogeneous agent um, but the conclusion we came to is that uh, both models uh, can be solved in exactly the same way because the aggregate supply curve and the aggregate demand curve um, they have the exact same expression whether you have a representative agents so or a mass of households that are all identical or heterogeneous agents. Um, so what I want to do now is to um, represent graphically the solution of the model so that you can understand better uh, the forces at play and see a little bit how, you know, what it means to solve the model. Um, and that will also allow us to see, you know, what happens if we are not um, at the solution of the model. So if, you know, like if you want to think about what would happen if tightness was not the tightness that solves the model, we can think a little bit about how we can get to that. And then that will allow us to bridge a little bit with the discussion in the uh, old disequilibrium literature, you know, um, or situations where you are in equilibrium or in disequilibrium, you know, whether you're at market clearing or away from market clearing. Here, none of this makes really very much sense because the transactions are always given by a matching function. So there is no, you know, the notion of being uh, having a market that doesn't clear uh, is not present here. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we will we'll be able to draw some parallel with that old literature um, and reinterpret a little bit these discussions. So how do we solve our micro matching model? Um, so we saw that uh, at the end of the day, to solve it, we have to figure out what is the market tightness that uh, prevails in the model. And then once we have tightness, we can figure out the value of all the other variables. Um, and so, to figure out uh, the tightness in the model, so we have to, at the end of the day, you know, it's um, basically equivalent to solving a two by two system, so a system of two variables and two equations. And the um, two variables are output and tightness. The two equations are basically, uh, you know, an aggregate demand equation and an aggregate supply equation. All right, and so in fact, so we saw that uh, the solution of the model was given by um, the following system. So first we know that on the demand side, uh, households, they are going to uh, spend a fraction sigma, which is the marginal propensity to spend of their income, and their income is given by uh, of, of their income, which is f of x, okay, plus their uh, endowment of real wealth, and then on the supply side, you know that. Uh, given how many services are, uh, given the capacity K of all households and the probability to sell a service, you know that output is going to be equal to uh, Y like this. So this is our demand equation and this is our supply equation. Uh, so this is how we can solve uh, the model. And so then we had introduced uh, an aggregate supply curve which is y s of x is equal to f of x times k. And 
And um, we had introduced also an aggregate demand curve, but it, it's useful to, okay, so I think it's useful to maybe introduce two versions of the demand curve. Uh, one that's useful to solve the model and the other one that's useful to interpret what's going on. So uh, we had introduced an AD curve which was yd yd of x and that was uh, basically sigma x over 1 minus sigma x mu p that was uh, mu over p that was our AD curve and this you know if you go back you know that that can be expressed as a function of the parameter of the model That was our AD curve. Um, uh, but here, let me introduce a third equation, which you know I think is is going to be useful. Let me call it. Uh, it's so it's an alternative uh, if you want AD curve. Um, so let me call it. So the first AD curve that we had introduced is because uh, it basically captures how much households want to spend. But if we already take into account the fact that their income, in the aggregate, the income of all households is just equal to the spending of all households, uh, you know, through the matching process, because a dollar spent by a household is a dollar earned by another household. And so once you take that into account, you can obtain this AD curve. But if we want if you want a purer AD, uh, an AD curve that captures more the optimal spending decision by household, so that captures directly the first equation that we have here, uh, we could call it y uh, b of x, which is you know the demand curve, but that captures the behavior of the household. So b is for behavior. And this really captures uh, how much households would like to uh, to spend, but without substituting anything, you know, given some income that they consider. So yb of x, we'll just define it as sigma x. And so I'm just going to use the first equation over here. So ys of x plus mu over p. And this uh, behavioral uh, AD curve, which really captures uh, the behavior of the household, what you can notice is that actually you can directly, uh, so this is AD curve, you can consider it as a pure AD curve, and this one you can create as a, can create a behavioral AD curve um, that, you know, hasn't been, uh, you know, with that, which captures some of the supply aspect, because of course the supply curve shows up here as an income. Um, so, these three curves, of course, are uh, intimately uh, related because, in fact, you can see that the alternative AD curve, this behavioral AD curve, uh, yb of x is actually sigma x ys of x, so the supply curve, but plus 1 minus sigma x yd of x, the pure AD curve. So, in fact, uh, this behavioral This behavioral uh, equation, which captures, I think maybe it's, it's just this is really capturing how for if for given tightness that's expected by households, how much uh, they would like to spend, and of course that depends on the supply curve because um, the supply curve gives the income of the household, but that will depend also on. Our, AD curve this uh, because of course um, households spend not only out of income but also out of their real wealth and that element that they also spend out of the out of their real wealth uh, appears uh, you know through this AD curve that we have here and in a sense uh, departure 
And this is all quite very interesting. Uh, the departure from sales law, you know, sales law says that how much that supply creates its own demand. So under sales law, y b of x uh, spending behavior by household will just be equal to y s of x. But here you can see that y b of x is actually a linear combination. behavior, the spending behavior is a linear combination of supply and demand uh, because this sigma that we have here, which is the marginal propensity to spend, is between 0 and 1. And so 1 minus sigma is also between 0 and 1. Um, Yes, so um, I mean, so this is all um, very different from what's going what's going on in the Valrasian model. Um, yes, so uh, let's see. So this instead of calling it an adi curve. Because of course this involves both the supply side aspect of it. Uh, maybe we can just call it a behavioral curve, just because it captures the behavior uh, of the households. Um, Yeah, so all these subtleties here appear because, of course, the income of the household um, that come from the, the supply side, of course, is going to determine how much they spend because here they spend a, a fraction sigma of their income plus endowment. Um, and so that's why, you know, um, but of course, and what's tricky is that if, if we were just focusing on the behavioral curve, it's hard to know how it depends on X because you have elements that are increasing in X, decreasing in X, because of course, uh, uh, the, supplies, the supply curve, the income of households is increasing in tightness. And we said how much they want to spend out of it is going to be decreasing in tightness, which is why it's useful to introduce this aggregate demand curve, this pure aggregate demand curve that capture only what's going on on the, on the demand side, and as you can see, you know it captures um, it captures the endowment of wealth. And then this, you know, captures um, basically the ratio between the marginal propensity to spend. You know, this is um, sigma over one minus sigma, so it's a marginal propensity to spend over the marginal propensity to spend to save. So it's basically marginal propensity to spend over one minus the marginal propensity to spend. Um, so this really captures, you know, how much you want to spend, what is your endowment, but kind of um, once we've cleaned out uh, the income of the household. Because you know that income will just become you know through, once we've cleaned out basically the influence of sales law, um, the fact that your income is just going to mechanically uh, you know your income come from a spending from somebody else. So we have to clean that out to actually get a pure aggregate demand curve, uh, which depends only on marginal propensity to spend and endowment of uh, of wealth. So, uh, so this is quite interesting. Um, what? So now that we have, so let, let's try to stick to this terminology. So we have a supply curve and. Uh, aggregate demand curve which is really a pure demand side thing and then we have this behavioral curve that captures how much households want to spend out of uh, tightness. Now 
So there are two equivalent formulation of the solution of the model. And again, you know, this is valid whether you have a, uh, whether you have a representative agent or heterogeneous agent, so representative agent or heterogeneous agent. So one way that you could formulate it is that y is yb of x and y has to also be equal to the aggregate supply. This is just uh, what we have over there. Here I've just rewritten uh, our expression here. But then if uh, the expression for the behavioral curve, which we know is a combination of aggregate supply and aggregate demand, and then y is equal to ys of x. Right, and then once uh, I combine these two things, you know, I can substitute out y, and then so this is exactly equivalent to, uh, well, on the one hand, we know that y is ys of x, but on the other hand, this also gives us ys of x is equal to sigma x, ys of x plus 1 minus sigma x, yd of x. And therefore, I can rewrite that system as output is given by the supply curve, um, the aggregate supply curve yf of x. And at the same time, here, if I bring this element here, ys of x, and the other side, I get 1 minus sigma x, ys of x it has to be equal to 1 minus sigma x, yd of x. And of course, you know, this is, uh, this is, strictly greater than zero, so it has to be that uh, ys of x is equal to yd of x once I divide both sides here by 1 minus sigma. So output is on the, uh, is given by the supply side of things and tightness is uh, such that aggregate supply is equal to aggregate demand. Output given by the AS curve and tightness such that AS curve is equal to AD curve. Uh, so that's uh, that's how the model is going to operate here. Uh, this is very important to uh, to realize that that in the model uh, will always be on the aggregate supply curve. That's because it captures how much the capacity of the economy and how matching works. And furthermore, when the as the solution of the model, the aggregate supply will also be equal to the aggregate demand, and so therefore will also be on the demand curve. Um, and so so this is uh, this is you know, just a general formulation of how to solve the model where we separate the supply demand and this behavioral curve that we have here um, that we can substitute out. Uh, that we can substitute out. The reason we substitute it out is that its behavior is complex because it blends uh, aspects of demand and supply. Um, so this is the structure. And now what we can do, what we'll be able to do next is to actually uh, use graph to see uh, to see exactly how we can solve um, for this system.